Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 8, Non-Infectious Disease and Disorders. This is video number seven, and we're going to look at the second group of these non-infectious diseases, environmental disease. In this video, we're going to follow on from the previous one when we were looking at genetic diseases to focus in on some of the consequences or the links between environmental exposure and certain types of disease. As with the genetic diseases, you need to be able to describe an example of an environmentally related disease, uh, to be able to contrast um, diseases associated with environmental exposure to other types of non-infectious disease, and specifically you want a case study. So I'll give you a, a kind of a bit of an overview of something you might want to look at, and obviously there's going to be plenty of options for you to choose from. In the previous video we looked at the range of different types of non-infectious disease, and the fact that there are uh, a whole lot of diseases or disorders that are suffered uh, by humans that aren't related to pathogens, that are not caused by infectious agents. And in addition to that, there's been a change in the incidence uh, of a number of different types of disease based on um, the fact that the population as a whole is living longer and there's been significant improvements in areas uh, like hygiene, medicine, um, quality of drinking water, all of those sorts of things. But along with that longevity, that increase in our understanding of how the body works, we've also had a number of different diseases start to arise from some of our lifestyle choices. Some of the ways that we live, some of the environmental agents that we've exposed ourselves to either deliberately or indirectly have led to an increase in certain types of disease. Cardiovascular disease, diseases caused by certain uh, abuse of substances such as alcohol or nicotine, um, and also diseases that are related to exposure to things like um, ultraviolet radiation from the sun. All of these can come into this category of environmental exposure. So there can be types of radiation, there can be certain types of chemicals, and there are a range of different sources of each of these different types of agents that can create um, certain diseases or disorders within the body. So when we're trying to narrow down our look specifically at diseases caused by environmental exposure, then we want to start to think about what are some of the diseases, I guess, that are most, uh, that, that come to mind first when we think about some of the important factors in the environment. And when we're thinking about um, factors in the environment, we're going to split them up primarily into two categories, some physical factors and some chemical factors. Physical factors are going to be um, factors such as ultraviolet radiation. We'll have a look at this in a little bit more detail because we do want to um, focus in one of the areas that we're looking at in this topic is cancer. And so this is a nice link to, I guess, give you two for the price of one. If you have a look at the incidence of melanoma, the links um, suggesting um, some uh, causal or at least some agents that are increase the risk associated with uh, melanoma. And specifically those uh, risks associated to exposure to the sun. And so we have a number of public health campaigns uh, each summer that help to remind us of the importance of not overexposing our skin um, to ultraviolet radiation. But you're probably also aware of agents uh, that are chemical agents too. One we're going to be looking at uh, heavy metals, uh, things like asbestos, and the associated diseases such as mesothelioma, um, and all sorts of different uh, other agents, uh, pesticides, insecticides, uh, agents of war that have all been used uh, to create problems, either um, at the extreme end death or indirectly a number of different uh, consequences of the use of particular chemicals, things like Agent Orange as well, um, that have had uh, often lasting impacts on uh, populations. The same is true when we're looking at uh, physical in terms of uh, nuclear radiation. 
And there's always a lot of discussion around nuclear power generation, but there have been a couple of occasions where there has been uh, problems associated with the generation of power from uh, nuclear fuel sources and what happens um, when the radiation escapes. So that's what we're looking at in this particular um, section of this module is some of these diseases that can be linked to any of these environmental exposures to physical or chemical agents. Uh, but what we want to do is we want to try and see if we can narrow our focus down a little bit so that we can um, primarily look at one example and you do need to develop a case study. So when you're developing your case study, you can either focus on some of these um, physical factors in the environment or some of the chemical ones. In this particular video, I want to um, shift over to the chemicals to have a focus on the chemicals in the environment. Um, because as I say, I probably will come back later on to look at uh, physical exposure and the links between things like ultraviolet radiation and incidence of melanomas. But one of the things that we have learned quite a lot about is the um, problems associated with heavy metals. On the previous slide, I looked at um, the link between mesothelioma and asbestos, and that's another chemical, environmental chemical that can have a very negative impacts on the body. But it's lead that I guess is one of the ones that's um, created some headlines but is continuing to create problems too. Partly because um, lead paints in particular were used quite widely when we didn't understand the link between um, lead and uh, brain disorders. So let's look at this in just a little bit more detail. So let's try and focus a little bit on, um, I guess, what you might put together as a small case study, um, focusing in on lead paint. So lead is a heavy metal. And whilst it's primarily found, I guess, um, in, in its major usage in lead paint, we now know that the problem is that it can also leach into the soil. And if it leaches into the soil, then it can also get into our waterways. And uh, the problem with something like lead is that you can have very, very small concentrations. Parts per million can create um, problems, particularly in um, childhood development. And you can see a lot of these um, consequences are often linked into the what's happened um, as we go through uh, childhood. So I guess the big problem is that if, if you have children in an area where uh, there's been a large amount of lead, uh, maybe it's the, the houses that were painted that have uh, subsequently been knocked down, some of that lead has leached into the uh, soil. It may simply be that you know uh, old paints were being sanded back for a repainting job and people didn't realize that they were lead based. And so you're spreading all of this lead all around the place. The problem that happens is on young developing brains. And we know that the link here is very strong between lead and brain disorder. And you can see a small list that I've put together here on this um, slide, including learning disabilities, speech disorders, lower IQs, behavioral disorders, health problems, and hyperactivity, all associated with um, higher than um, safe levels of exposure to lead in childhood. Of course, there can be some quite significant social and potentially legal implications of um, young people who grow up in, a, in such a manner that does not allow their brains to develop in an, under a normal pattern. And so this can lead to all sorts of different potential consequences. And we do need to be careful when we're talking, especially when we're, we're looking at this area of science, this area of biology, about the difference between correlation and causation. So one thing I, I don't want to uh, give the impression of is that if a child is exposed to lead at a very early age in, in terms of their brain development, that they are automatically going to either be a problem for the juvenile justice system or they're going to need to be part of a special education unit. That's, that's, uh, that's linking causation. That's if this happens, then this happens. 
So we can't, we don't have enough information to know that one is going to directly cause the other one. But we do know that there's correlation. We do know that there's some sort of relationship between these two. And that's part of what we're trying to do in our study of non-infectious disease. We're trying to see if there are any patterns we can identify, whether there are any risk factors. And a lot of the time we will be talking about risk factors. And that's something that your doctor will be doing when you first talk to them. They'll be getting a little bit of a history. They'll be getting uh, a sense of uh, how much alcohol you consume, uh, whether you're a smoker or not, uh, how much exercise you do. Obviously, they'll measure your weight. They'll get a bit of a sense of your diet. And all of these things are contributing factors to um, potential diseases which you may have or which you may contract at some point in the future. There's no direct cause relationship between these, but there certainly does seem to be some correlation, some increase in the risk associated with the development of some of these um, that's associated with exposure to something like lead. So lead levels uh, that can be in the soil, in the water, uh, on the walls, can all contribute to um, some uh, irregular development of the brain, especially in childhood. This is a very quick overview, and obviously there's a lot of things that you can add into your study of heavy metals. You could focus on asbestos. You could focus on ultraviolet radiation. Uh, any of these would work well as environmental exposure agents, and the important thing is to be able to talk about them and to write about them uh, in your HSE exam. Thanks for watching.